Graham. <clears throat> Hope you can see me, you can hear me, those people who are actually online. This is going to be our March 6 meeting, and uh, I'm going to go through a few as usual. Those of you who, how many of you actually are new to the group? Okay, <laughs> one, two, three, four. <laughs> Leo, you're not new. Five. All right. So for those of you who are new, you know, maybe you'll find this interesting, um, useful, because I've been going through this every meeting actually. But um, so we started in person meetings, you know, um, in December, starting with December. But as I mentioned, you know, we our old office was Microsoft. They closed they closed it. So now we are actually meeting at this office. So for the time being, we don't actually have a hybrid meetings. We're going to be in person and also online. But I highly recommend you guys come in person because your experience is going to be much better than um, than online, obviously. So if you're in Atlanta, highly, highly recommend and Actually, at the very beginning, when I started this group in 2010, for 10 years, I resisted fiercely against um, online meetings because I wanted to build a community. I wanted to build a community spirit. But the things have changed. So now, for the time being, we're going to do actually in person and online. Uh, our main uh, website is on Meetup. Uh, so those of you who are new, um, you can go ahead and register if you search for Atlanta BI group users or something like this, uh, you will find it. Let me just go real quick to this uh, URL in here. Uh, um, so the group name is, well, I should know that, but Atlanta Microsoft Business Intelligence Users. So if you search for that group over there, can go ahead and register. Our meetings are complimentary, and they're gonna get notifications uh, for every meeting. So we typically meet on the first Monday of the month, unless it falls on a holiday, and then we switch to the second. First Monday of the month, time for BI, right? It's put in your calendar, 6.30, come here. Um, if you like, if you get value, you know, after each meeting, just go and spread the word uh, and tell your coworkers, um, the recording. So we started actually recording every meeting since COVID, and this URL right here, bit.ly Atlanta BIRX, that's going to bring you to YouTube. That's where you're going to find the videos of the past recordings. If you want to get a little bit more involved, we're always looking for sponsors. Sponsors meaning a company that wants to buy us pizza, pass, depending on how many people are coming around $100, $150, something like that. And if you want to present, um, let me know. Always looking for speakers, for sponsors. If you want to donate when we don't have a sponsor, you can uh, get that money to buy pizza. So this is our um, donation page in here. Okay. Next thing on the agenda, jobs. Does anybody have any... Um, announcement for job opening your company might have for Microsoft BI talent. Is anybody looking for any? Yes, go ahead. Hello, uh, I'm building a startup. Um, I, my background is in civil engineering. I practiced for 13 years and I resigned last year. There's a lot of inefficiencies in civil engineering, so I am in the process of developing a, a software or the civil design firms, and I'm looking uh, help. So if, if you're interested, let me know. So what kind of uh, skills you're looking for? Basically, yeah, like uh, in, uh, it needs to integrate with uh, SharePoint and on-prem service, so Azure, uh, different Azure tools. I kind of set up the architecture, so I need somebody who knows more. Okay. So, yeah. so if you, um, I'm not sure, actually probably I'm not logging to Microsoft Teams, but, um, or maybe you can somehow put it on the board or something, you know, how to contact you, that'll be awesome. Okay. Uh, if you log into Microsoft Teams, also you can put it in the chat. But there was a opening here, um, somebody started a startup and he's looking for people to help him actually build the system. And it's so funny, I can relate to this story because my son actually is in Georgia Tech right now and he studies civil engineering. I tried my best to kind of direct him to 
programming, but he yeah. doesn't want to do it. You know, independent. He was doing something. So in ten years, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Anybody else looking for uh, for BI Microsoft BI yeah. professionals? No. Okay. Yeah. Pass. Couple of events worth mentioning. Uh, Power BI Summit actually is happening right now. So if you're looking for a conference for Power BI, I um, find this one interesting actually. Four day conference or five days. I think there is a nominal fee like uh, $90 or something like this, but there's a bunch of Microsoft speakers and MVPs also. I want to check this out. It's called Power BI Summit Virtual Conference. And the next thing that caught my attention, uh, I was searching for conferences. I found that there is actually Atlanta Cloud Conference happening on March 23. So this is actually a complimentary event. It's not only just Microsoft Cloud, not only Azure, but also AWS. You know, So if you're interested in cloud technologies, want to learn more, maybe this one will be um, a good one to verify. ATLCloudConf.com. Anybody else knowing about any events of interest around yeah, Power BI? I yeah? think that uh, Atlanta Cloud Conference is March 25th, not the 23rd. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Third is a Thursday, 25th, something like that. Right, March 25th then. So, so that one I'm going to speak at um, Embedded of Cloud Management. Okay. And uh, Atlanta Cloud Conference. This one? All right, so is it March 25th? Yes. All right, March 25th, not March 23rd. Sorry. Anything else it's happening? It's going to be at Kennesaw University. Okay, Kennesaw University for the Atlanta Cloud. Any other events worth mentioning that anybody know around BI, Microsoft BI, anything? Nope. All right. Next thing, usually what I do, I cover some uh, Microsoft BI news since the last time we met, which was a February, beginning of February. Nothing or chattering right now. Um, for the past month or so, I want to um, actually show you three things. Custom colors for text fields in uh, charts visualization. Uh, enhanced row level security editor and the new get data experience. So I'm going to show you a little bit of these three things, going to show you quick demos. And the final thing that I want to mention is that there is a performance optimization in Power BI, we have this uh, data access method, um, uh, data access method called direct query, which when you run the report directly, the report go and directly hits the data source. We have some uh, performance optimization queries are running in parallel now, so uh, that might be interesting to learn more about it. But real quick, what I'm going to do, we call this prototypes with pizza, where Somebody gives a short tip or something like this. For the lack of uh, tips today, I'm going to show you these three new features. So the first one that we have here um, is um, conditional coloring. So let's say you have a chart like this and uh, you want to highlight, you want to change the color of specific data points. So previously you have to write a DAX measure, so it was a little bit more complicated. But now what we can do we could actually go to the, um, with the chart selected, we can go to the uh, properties. And because this is a column chart, we got to go to the columns um, um, bucket here. And here we have actually a custom uh, formatting option. So every time in Power BI, I see this FX button right here. Well, basically that means that you can actually customize this. You can write some, um, you can, you know, have some rules and that brings you to a conditional formatting where we have different options. And one thing that I want to point out here, I kind of struggle with this feature to be honest, because initially my chart had a uh, DAX measure. And if you have a DAX measure, you will, uh, you will find that this, uh, you won't be able to find this summarization, oops, this summarization thing in here. So to get this to work, what I had to do is to bind the chart to a regular numeric field, not a measure, because you want this. And once you have this, you can say, oh, I want to customize the text field. So because in this case, on the X axis, I have the person name, which is a text field, which is, you know, the one that I selected here. And then the new feature is that now we can say, oh, if the axis has a text field, then we can use all of this um, criteria contains, start with. 
So for example, here I can say, oh, okay, I want to highlight all the data points that started with uh, Mitchell or whatever the person name is in this case. So I do that, I click OK, and I obviously I specify what color I want and, you know, um, change the color basically on based on a text field. That's the new feature. I don't know why, why we had to wait for eight years for this feature to <laughs> come in, but now we got it, so that's cool. The next thing, do you guys know what role level security is in Power BI? Anybody know what that is? I know, Leo, you know, you guys know. But essentially, imagine you build Power BI report, and now management comes and say, oh, I don't want to open this for the, to the entire company. I want only specific people to see it, but not only specific people to see it. I want the data to secure the data. So if you're a high level manager, you can see everything. If you're not, then you kind of see portion of the of the data. So we call this a row level security. That required DAX programming a little bit, but now they kind of simplified. I, you know, those of you who actually have experienced Power BI, I'll let you know. I'll poll you after I show you a feature, see if you like that feature. But it, if you go to Power BI desktop to manage roles, which is where you define roles uh, for row level security, as you can see, uh, the user interface probably has changed a little bit, but what's more interesting is that let's say I want to um, to secure, I have here a table called sales territory. So here I have countries. So now I want to create a role that is going to be North America. Let's say we're going to name this role North America right here. And for well, the lack of a better example, what I'm going to do, members of this role should be able to access only what? Only United States when the country is United States, Canada, or Mexico. So what I can do here now, we have an add button in here, and I can say, okay, um, I want to create a filter on sales territory country where it's United States right here, right? So I'm just typing it, if I can. And then I can click add button one more time and I can say sales order country where it's uh, maybe Canada. And I can hit the button one more time where <laughs> I say where it's uh, Mexico in here. But interesting, so what they're trying to do here is to simplify to, for some cases, for simpler expressions to help you not to write DAX. But let's say the things are more complicated. Let's say I want to say, where the country is United States or Canada. And so I want to have like an and and or conditions. So what you can do once you actually specify this criteria, you can group those things and you can say if you want to have an or filter, this is actually any. So what I'm what I'm saying here is that if the country is United States or Canada, then OK, this will work. For the rest, everything outside the group, I can use the default all, which is actually a end filter. So if you struggle to understand what actually happens behind the scenes, you can always go to the DAX editor when nothing else help, uh, helps. And here what you can see is that um, the magnifier is not working. I know. It's going to magnify. Okay, so basically what the expression says here is that if the sales territory comes to the United States or, which is in DAX, is double pipe, and Mexico. So basically this is what they this is what they saving you. You know, writing this expression in DAX, you can write it using a user interface. Is this feature useful? Those of you who, yeah, kind of. All right, so. Okay. Does the uh, graphical editor let you uh, nest groups like more than one level B? I think so. I can keep probably keep on nesting. So let's say this is a group. Ooh, let's say, okay, maybe I create another one in here and I do something like that. And then, how do I nest? Well, I have to select multiple things. Oh, you mean like nests within groups? Yeah. Like, okay, that probably. 
Uh, you always the one asking difficult questions. <laughs> I don't know. Is the answer. <laughs> if nothing helps, go and write text. Um, and the third thing, the gate data experience is no more. So let's go to see if you're going to miss that feature. So what we're going to do now, we're going to go to Power BI, right? All right. So in Power BI, what we used to have, this is actually Power BI Cloud now, where we share our stuff with other users. Um, what we used to have here is in every workspace you go, uh, there used to be a get data button in here, right? A nice big get data button at the bottom of the screen, and that button disappeared and disappeared. Uh, because Microsoft changed the user interface a little bit. So now if you want to. To upload like a data set or report, everything is driven through the menus in here. So for example, if I want to create a new report, I go in here, it asks me what data set I want to connect to. So don't be uh, alarmed that this button is gone. You know, basically it's replaced with the these menus that we hear that we have in the workspace page. Another thing that is gone is when you click that get get data button, you get the option to install samples. So let's say you're new to Power BI, you want to get some sample reports for financial industry or something like this. Now they're gone because the get uh, data is gone, but they are in the learn section. So here on the left side, we have a learn menu. So when we click on that, this is where the sample reports are. And the old samples, if you're familiar with old samples, they are actually some of them are gone. But so now we have a new one, new reports. Um, actually, this looks like the old samples in here, so maybe not everything is gone. But this is where the samples are. Get data is gone to replace with the new user reports. All right, that's it. Any questions about what I covered so far? No. All right. So this meeting is going to be. I want to tell you actually a little bit about <laughs> how this meeting came to to uh, materialize. So our last meeting uh, was. I mean, those of you. How many were? You, uh, how many attended our last meeting in February? You were there, right? You. All right. A so, few of you. So last meeting was about Lake House also. So we had Microsoft came, you know, Patrick LeBlanc, guy in the cube came in to tell us about the Microsoft vision about the lake house and all of this and all that stuff. And so I got excited and I wrote a blog about it, you know, the lake house, the good, the bad and the ugly. <laughs> I like this, the good, bad and the ugly. And uh, in the ugly part, I was criticizing the Delta Lake because actually I was criticizing the architecture because most people just take it to the to the heart when it makes sense, when it doesn't. So they go and build these zones in the Delta Lake, and now we have a Delta Lake, and now it's so confusing, you know. So I said, okay, Delta Lake probably makes sense in some cases, but in some cases it's, it probably doesn't make sense. And then Databricks actually got excited about this block and, you know, they kind of started, oh, you don't know what you're talking about here. You know, we have a great story about it, the Delta Lake. And they offered to do a presentation and I took them for it, you know, said, come here and do us a presentation on Delta Lake. So I'm so excited to actually have Leo, the main presenter, because Leo, he has a very similar background as me. You know, I came as a BI professional, Microsoft stack, you know, data warehousing and, Analysis services and Power BI, all classic BI stuff. He's got his experience. So what I'm really looking forward from this presentation is for him to uh, tell us, you know, when it makes sense to use it. So let's say I start a new project. You know, I got to do it with a relational database the old way, but now we have a new way. So that's why I'm expecting for him to do. So Leo, sorry for putting you on the spot no, no in problem. here. But uh, he's going to do it. He's with Databricks, and our sponsor is Databricks as well. And next meeting, real quick, is going to be on April 3rd. Improving is going to sponsor it. Thank you so much. We're still working on the speaker um, and all that stuff. So 
Leo, with that said, why don't you come here? Yeah, no problem. And tell us everything about the de Delta Lake. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Let me disappear. Oh, oh got to give you a mic. Okay. Um, I, I can probably project without it. Um, if I turn off my, my team's microphone, is it, am I going to start like, Doing like a weird echo because it's going to come through there. And then... I didn't see that when I was doing it. So all I had to do is to go to the devices in Microsoft Team and make sure that you choose that there is a special name for it. It's not always going to go to your laptop, right? So if you go to the devices, there we go. Devices. Is your microphone on or is it on? 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 Is it Cool, I'm going to share my screen. Oh, there you go. Sorry. Where in the world is my presentation? Wow, oh, there we go. Oh, uh, I think we're hooked up. Um, so yeah, I interesting. You published that blog, and actually, uh, Kyle wrote the blog. Uh, he's our, our 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 virtual presenter today. He's a way better present uh, presenter than I am. So you get the best part last, and Kyle's actually gonna give us a bunch of wicked awesome de awesome demos. But um, Kyle read it, and he's like, "Hey, Leo, uh, you're local to the Atlanta BI user group." You're going to present um, at the next next session, and, and I'll back you up. And I'm like, okay, that's that's cool. Um, but yeah, interestingly enough, I I it's probably been like a decade since I've been to like the the user group meetings. And, and prior to that, it was like the SQL Server um, and like Atlanta BI user group meeting. And to, and to tell you like how long it's been, I, I used to have hair like back when when we used to kind of meet up. <laughs> so it's it's been a really long time. 
Um, but my name's Leo Furlong. Um, I'm a senior solutions architect with, with Databricks. I'm in the finan financial services industry segment. I've been with Databricks almost two years. Um, prior to Databricks, um, I basically was in the Microsoft you know, business intelligence um, industry, and I did consulting for, for various consulting partners. So I worked for a company called uh, Intellinet for about seven and a half years. It was local to the Atlanta area. And then I uh, jumped ship and went to a company called Blue Granite. Blue Granite has since been acquired and is now part of 3Cloud. But I worked for uh, Blue Granite for about seven and a half, seven and a half years as well. And then um, I, you know, I transitioned and started working on a lot of Azure projects um, as Microsoft started developing a lot of like Azure data services and cloud capabilities. And then it's kind of like one of those projects I actually started focusing and, and, and doing a lot of work with Azure Databricks. And so um, I got more and more interested in Azure Databricks. Um, Databricks launched their, their their partner champions program and I became a partner champion. And then I got uh, um, basically invited to get access to the Databricks kind of like quarterly roadmap. I got to see their 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 vision and their strategy for you know like what analytics would, would look like within the Databricks ecosystem. And then also, um, you know, basically to see like the, the pace of innovation and all the features and functionality that they're developing. And I decided to jump on board. And so I've been with Databricks for, uh, again, like almost two years. Um, I'm an SA and I'm assigned to specific accounts, but I also function as like a Power BI SME within Databricks. And um, I guess really the only thing that qualifies me to be a Power BI SME is the fact that I used to develop a, a ton of uh, analysis services tabular projects. And so I know how to like, you know, kind of get the table relationships and the, and the inner workings to work with good performance, but I can't create a, a sexy dashboard to save my life. So um, I, I'm terrible um, in regards to actually kind of creating a report canvas and things like that. Um, Kyle, do you want to do a quick intro before we kind of jump into slides? <clears throat> yeah, first off, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, so everybody, fantastic to, uh, to be here virtually. My name is Kyle Hale. I'm actually based out of Houston, Texas. Um, I've been doing Microsoft BI and Azure Cloud Analytics uh, my entire career, which is uh, entering year 20 this year. Um, been a big fan of Teo's uh, stuff from way back in the day, like followed you back, you know, we're doing analysis services on prem. Um, so he's been he's been a guiding light for a lot of my own career and like stuff I like to do, been doing BI consulting. Um, recently came to Databricks about 18 months ago. Uh, and just like Leo, because I came from that background, you know, found myself helping out on the Power BI side, the Microsoft Analytics stack side. Um, and today my role is actually as a product specialist for Databricks SQL. So I'm here to show a little bit today with with Power BI and Databricks SQL and uh, how they can do great things together. Nice to meet everyone. Cool. Um, so if, if you're, I guess, how, is, is anybody here like worked with the Databricks platform before? Are you familiar with Databricks, the company at all? So uh, a, a couple people. Um, but you know, Databricks, we like to call ourselves the data and AI company. And we were the inventor and the pioneer of the data, the data Lakehouse platform. So there's a lot of vendors in the space now that are calling themselves basically Lakehouse platform. We were the inventors of it. So if you've tried a Lakehouse on another platform um, and, and you, you don't feel like it's that great of a, a capability or a paradigm yet, definitely try it out on Azure Databricks before you kind of make up your mind and, um, you know, I guess downplay it. Um, Gartner has recognized this as a leader in both the you know, data management systems and also data science and machine learning. And the original founders of, of Databricks actually created the original Apache Spark project. And um, Databricks, you know, over the course of its, its tenure has also created very successful open source projects with the Delta Lake storage format and also MLflow. Um, over the course of the, you know, the 10 year duration that Databricks has existed, it's raised over $3 billion in investment, um, you know, with a lot of that money coming, you know, effectively from the, the, the hyperscalers like Azure. And within that, we now have like over 5,000 employees across the globe. Um, from a customer basis perspective, um, we have over 7,000 customers uh, from Fortune 500 companies to, to unicorns. And we're pretty much in every single, basically industry vertical. And I, I don't know how many, you know, uh, first of all, I don't know how many Fortune 500 companies are actually in Atlanta. I know it's a lot, but there's a huge chance that um, if you're a Fortune 500 company, you're either evaluating Databricks or you're actually using Databricks in production. So uh, we're going to cover a little bit on like what a lake house is, and I realize that some of this is kind of duplicative because there's a lot of people that actually attended or at least watched the session online from last week. So I don't want to like hyper analyze what the lake house is. Today we're really um, Kyle and I are really trying to pitch and talk about this new concept of like a semantic lighthouse, uh, which is kind of a combination of effectively like a lakehouse platform with Power BI and what that could actually look like in production. Um, but for starters, I, I do want to kind of like take a step back 
and actually kind of like level set what the problem statement is and like why like Databricks created the lake house platform in the, in the in the first place so from like a, a um you know like a large company data and analytics ecosystem perspective um you know companies need all sorts of use cases and capabilities right so they've got they need data engineering uh capabilities they need to be those to be scalable they need to be cost effective um large organizations many times often have streaming use cases and streaming requirements where they need to be able to stream data and process it in real time uh, they may need may even need to be able to like apply machine learning to those streaming data sets in real time as well um they need to be able to create data science and machine learning capabilities and within that they even need like a, a ml ops platform and end-to-end -end machine learning capabilities and even model surveying capabilities within that ecosystem as well and then you know finally like you know classic data warehousing and business intelligence is still critical and important to uh you know, you know modern analytics within a, within an organization and you need to be able to effectively serve you know high concurrency and low latency and, and fast query performance um, at scale for your enterprise um, and, and within that though like the data space has changed a lot as well right so we've got tons of different types of data we've got structured data we've got unstructured data there's big data we still need to be able to perform and scale well at small data sets as well and then like we talked about a second ago we have um, we have slow data that we want to process in batch or maybe in like some micro batches and then we have fast data that we may need, actually need to stream into the platform and really like the end goal is to create kind of curated data sets um, effectively create uh, data products on top of those data sets and get them out to the, into the company where it's going to create business value and either you know shrink our bottom line or actually generate revenue and then of course like within that right we need we need uh, enterprise security and governance we need to be able to uh, control and have access on that data and we need to be able to govern it and kind of like make and audit it and, and effectively have safe data. But within that, right, within each of these different use cases and capabilities, it effectively means we have a different system. So if we want to create a streaming product, we have to implement a streaming system. If we want to end, uh, uh, implement like a really highly scalable data engineering pl platform, we need a data engineering system. And then like effectively, you have a standalone data science and machine learning capability as well. And the same thing for data warehousing and business intelligence. And within that, there's multiple meta stores. We've got to move the data and copy it around. There's no single version of the truth. The security model for all those different systems is completely independent. We can't audit them seamlessly. And the only possible strategy we could we could to kind of bring any like realism of uh, of governance to this is to implement like a really massive data governance tool on top of this, and that can be complicated as well. So within that problem space, Databricks effectively invented and and pioneered this concept of the Databricks Lakehouse platform. And so, so within that, um, we we like to call it like simple, open, um, and, and collaborative, or simple, simple multi-cloud and collaborative. So at, at the very, very kind of bottom of the Databricks Lake Cloud platform, you have the three different hyperscalers, right? So um, you can implement uh, the Databricks Lake House platform on on Azure, on AWS, or GCP. And so uh, within that, you know, customers also we didn't talk about the second, but customers really want cheap and high performance object storage, right? So within each of the different cloud providers, you've got ADLS Gen 2, you've got S3, you've got uh, Google Cloud Storage. And then on top of that, uh, we provide the Delta Lake storage format that's going to give you data reliability and performance at scale for big data, small data, any type of data directly on top of object storage without having to have a proprietary kind of cloud data warehouse and proprietary storage formats in the mix. And then within that, we, we provide Unity Catalog. Unity Catalog sits on top of the Delta Lake storage format. It provides a singular meta store for all your different use cases. It provides security and governance and auditing, um, lineage capabilities, and, and kind of like data cataloging capabilities directly into the uh, the Unity catalog, kind of sitting on top of object storage. And so within that, of course, you know we have that platform consolidation play where the Databricks Lakehouse is able to provide data warehousing, data engineering, data streaming, a full end-to-end -end data science and machine learning capability with ML ops and model serving, and all of your user personas can effectively come to the Lakehouse platform interact with the tools um, and, and also the languages that they're familiar with with Python, SQL, Scala, and R in a consistent way uh, with a lot of collaboration. So it's a simple platform uh, because effectively we're consolidating and, and actually implementing less systems. So it's simple. It's multi-cloud, so we can literally take the same business solutions that we develop on one cloud and redeploy them in a very seamless and, 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 and uh, uh, strategic way to the other clouds as well without actually changing any code. And it's built on open formats. And so what we mean by that is it's built on top of open source software. It's also built on open storage formats, meaning that um, you know it, it, it's, there's less lock-in. Uh, you're not locked into using Databricks. At the end of the day, even if you're using the Delta Lake open protocol, which is available across many different systems, 
um, and many different tools. You can actually just completely get rid of the, the transaction log on top of the Delta Lake files. And it's just going to be a bunch of Parquet files and you can go take your data wherever you want to. So we're not really locking you in. So that being said, um, do you need a lake house? Um, and so Kyle, what do you think? What are, you, what are your, what are some of your thoughts there? Okay, so I, I brought this up in specifically in response to Teo's blog. And I think the short answer is like, not necessarily. Like we, the lake house is an evolution of mostly enterprise data patterns, specifically, like we said, data science and ML combined with data warehousing and BI. And usually now these days combined with real time and streaming as well. And those aren't things that just show up in every business at, at the same time or with the same level of maturity. So Lakehouse is mostly there to solve a set of problems that have already existed in enterprise before the Lakehouse existed. So I, I think the first thing is like if you're already experiencing the problems and you know if, if what Leo said resonated with you in your enterprise, the Lakehouse can be and, and usually is a really good fit for unifying all those and simplifying architectures you already have out there. If you're just getting started, you're a startup, you're on day one, you're a small medium business, you know, looking to do this, you know, you can definitely get away with just starting with a database and a notebook and, you know, pandas uh, on your laptop. We don't we don't recommend jumping to this because, you know, again, it's it's there to solve existing enterprise architecture patterns. Um, but that being said, like, you know, there are some limitations to a lot of those systems where we say, you know, the lake house provides a significant advantage. And specifically, I'm going to talk about two things, which is separation of compute and storage. Uh, and then just the cloud economics of, of spot pricing and just consumption economics. Um, the lake house is really, really designed to work on object storage, which is really, really cheap to store. And then on top of that, because we've separated that compute, you pay for the compute to do your query analysis and loading and ETL that. You can pay for it exactly when you need it and where you need it and how much you need it and no more. Um, and so really kind of separating those two pieces and then going on a consumption based model with the cloud because the cloud very generously for Databricks provides this great playground of infrastructure to get those machines and compute when we need it for our customers and provides that storage accounts for our customers. Um, they get, just make it really, really e easy to kind of do more true operational expense, you know, OPEX reporting um, and consumption based pricing. So when you take those two levers and you put them together against all these you know, different use cases, if you can provide a single architecture to support them so that the infrastructure you're bringing in, the engines you're putting on top of them, and the way you deal with that storage is kind of all simple and unified. It's not 50 different things just shoved in a box, but it's a kind of a simple interface. You really, really start to get to economies of scale and price performance. So that's that's the, where we would say you do need a lake house, or you can really take advantage of a lake house and get real benefits. But no, it's not for everybody. It's definitely not for people starting um, and I know a lot of times, like when we come to user groups, you know, there's a disconnect between the Fortune 500s of the world, you know, the Coca Colas and the UPSs of the world, and my business. Uh, we're not trying to encourage everybody to just jump into the lake house. So, uh, go ahead, Leo, you can, keep, you can pick it up from there. That's that's our two All cents right. on that. Thanks, Kyle. Um, <clears throat> so the 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 real kind of like underpinnings of the lake house, I and mean, I think we reviewed some of these concepts in the last presentation, and not everyone was there, but are really the combination of the Delta Lake storage format. And this, this uh, also this kind of the state of, state of the art vector engine, vectorized engine called Photon. So the, the Delta Lake storage format, again, it's an open source, uh, effectively table storage format that gives you fast kind of out of the box performance directly on top of object storage. And when you actually combine that with Photon, which is what Databricks built, is this like literally this vectorized engine that actually sits on top of the, the Apache Spark APIs. When you combine the two together, you get you know up to 12x query performance uh, without actually having to rewrite any of your Spark code. So it gives you a, a phenomenal kind of, um, you know, speed up on your queries, um, really able to, to uh, enhance your workloads. Uh, within that, right, uh, I think we, again, Patrick went into this in the last presentation. Um, I like to think of, at, at the very, very minimal, minimalistic elements, the Delta Lake storage format effectively is the combination of, of, of the Apache uh, Parquet storage format, which is a columnar-based kind of uh, storage format, with a transaction log, right? It's capable of, uh, of handling data really at any size, any shape, any speed. Um, it's an open format, meaning that like there's no, you know, it's future proof, there's no vendor lock-in. It's widely supported across a lot of the Azure data services. So obviously it's the it's the main storage format in Azure Databricks. Um, Azure Synapse is starting to standardize on, on Delta Lake storage format as well. There's readers directly in Azure Machine Learning, and you can even have Power BI point directly to Delta Lake tables and actually ingest it um, into Power BI with actually running any compute. Um, so within that, right, because there's a, a data management capability combined with asset transactions, 
with built-in data governance or data versioning, audit history kind of all built within the storage format. It gives you this ability to kind of have a single version of truth for both for your data lake and for your data warehousing data. And, and it, it, it was actually pretty cool in the presentation, uh, in the last presentation where Patrick actually went into, you know, how uh, Delta Lake under the covers actually, you know, it creates a parquet file and then like adds some data to the transaction log, which is basically a bunch of JSON files. And if you were to like update a file or delete a file, um, he showed how like effectively that parquet file would get rewritten and replaced. And then within the transaction log, it would actually kind of soft delete the old parquet file and say it's no longer is like the, the active version of the, to the table. It's great. It's cool to understand that, but very similar to like SQL Server in like back in the day or even currently when you'd like look at rows and pages and extents, like it's cool to know how that works, but you don't need to know or actually interact with any of that within the Delta Lake storage format. It's a table protocol. So you're just going to interact with Delta tables. And within that, Delta Lake gives you full data warehousing DML support. So I can run insert statements. I can run copy into statements to ingest a bunch of data really quickly. I can update the data with, an, with, with, with a basically an update statement. I can run a delete statement to support my uh, uh, GDPR and my CCPA use cases. And then, of course, like if you're if you built data engineering pipelines and a relational database before, you're probably really familiar with merge, and you probably expect that within a within a, a modern capability. And you can write merge statements directly on Delta Lake as well. Um, also, some really cool functionality that I like a lot is you know this concept of like time travel uh, built directly into the Delta Lake format. Um, you literally can do a described history and actually see all the versions of the transaction log that it kind of like existed within a single table. Um, there's this concept of time travel within the table where you can literally uh, query the table and see what the, the data looked like at that point in time. You can use a version number for that, or you can use a timestamp. If your data gets corrupted within your ETL job, you can really do a restore table um, and, and point it to basically do to a timestamp or to a version and actually roll your table back to that previous version. And then of course, like if you have a bunch of um, effectively old transactions within your, your transaction log for that table. You don't need them anymore. There's this concept of a vacuum command where you can actually delete those old versions. It'll delete the versions, then also the parquet files. Um, there was one comment or question in the previous presentation on like, if you start having like a really large transaction log kind of build up, will that impact performance? On the Databricks, the answer is no, but because you basically have a bunch of kind of soft deleted parquet files, if you just leave them out there in perpetuity, effectively you're gonna pay a lot more to, more to the the, the hyperscalers for your object storage. So that being said, like within the Databricks runtime, it kind of automatically like cleans up some of your transactions for you. And of course you can run the vacuum command to kind of get rid of those as well. Uh, can you ask that question again? Well, the, the Delta Lake storage fan of effectively is like a table protocol. So like those tables exist and then you can interact with them, but it's directly on top of object storage. So the transaction log like exists actually within the file format itself, but you don't actually you don't have to actually interact with the, the files themselves. Like you don't have to like read a parquet file. You just interact with the table. Does, it, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's, the, yes, correct. So kind of, and again, I, I'm kind of trying to gloss over some of this because I know we reviewed it last time and the, the concepts between you know, the Synapse Lake House and the data and the Databricks Lake House are mostly the same in regards to the Delta Lake storage format. But yeah, I mean, the, the, that's the, the whole goal of the Data Lake storage format is to kind of combine the best of the Data Lake with the best of the Data Warehouse functionality. So this is like a key feature slide, right? So with, with we talked about asset transactions and literally the ability to kind of like have different versions actually stored within the Delta table, but there's you know scalable metadata. We reviewed the time travel functionality. We talked about it's how it's open source. But it unifies kind of batch and streaming concepts. So not only can I um, read from like a pub sub source like a Kafka and write to a Delta table as a sync, but I can actually read from my Delta table as a streaming source and then write to another Delta Lake table as a streaming sync. So it can function both as a batch and a streaming table at the same time. Um, and it does so by effectively reading the transaction log um, as a as a basically as a stream. Um, there's scheme evolution and scheme enforcement kind of built into the format. So if I want to enforce the schema and have something fail because it doesn't you know, effectively conform to my schema, I can do that. But if I also have these nice kind of like scheme evolution, schema merge capabilities built in also. And then there's, I mean, like this is just like an overview. There's so many, so much, so many more like functional capabilities within the Delta Lake storage format and also performance capabilities that you know, effectively would just be another session. Um, 
probably because I'm a data warehousing geek by trade, right? My, one of my favorites is its the ability to support slowly changing dimensions, you know, directly on top of a data lake. So that was, again, that was a little bit of a primer um, just on the lake house concepts in general. And, and today we really wanted to focus on this concept of a semantic lake house. And again, like even to step backwards a little bit, just a little bit of a history lesson before we even talk about the semantic lake house, we're going to kind of, uh, kind of uh, evaluate, you know, effectively how we actually created um, enterprise semantic layers, you know, over the course of a couple of years, right? And so, uh, again, like myself, Teo, Kyle, lots of people in this room probably, um, you know, implemented, you know, kind of classic on-premise data warehousing and business intelligence architecture. And, and within that, you you essentially picked a tool like a you know, SQL Server on-premise, and you effectively kind of committed to that tool, and you kind of stayed in that ecosystem for many, many, many years. And within that, scalability was pretty linear up until you got to a, a certain threshold. And then effectively, your your box, your, your data warehouse box, no longer fit um, from a compute and from a data size perspective. And I had to do an upgrade project and effectively maybe look at an appliance or build um, you know, buy new hardware and kind of upgrade to my new hardware. And then it was it would scale um, as large as I actually size my my solution footprint. And then of course you had my my regular, you know, two to three year uh, you know, SQL server upgrade windows. And then even within that, right, we had to implement a lot of different layers of a solution um, in order to actually accomplish a, a true enterprise uh, cap enterprise semantic layer capability, right? So we do uh, SQL Server integration services to actually ingest data from data sources, effectively kind of stage that data into the into the SQL Server database. We do SQL Server integration services again to either uh, process the data in memory or maybe use the control flow and execute store procedures. Again, we're trying to model that to like a star schema. Um, there is kind of our main meta store and our main definition of the tables. And then from there, we would use a tool like um, Azure Analysis or sorry, Analysis Services Tabular or multi-dimensional. And we would create this kind of semantic model on top of the data warehouse. Most of the time we we did an import um, into its storage engine and into its meta stores uh, because like trying to do that in rollout mode just didn't work really well. And then finally, we would actually release those tabular models to like uh, reporting services, Excel, ProClarity, or like Pyramid Analytics, to name a few. Um, and, and again, that didn't even cover like data science and machine learning. So I'd have to buy a, a, a tool like SAS or maybe buy on-premise Hadoop. And so I'm just moving a lot of data around and creating a lot of different meta stores and there's a lot of governance models. And again, like the compute's just on 24 by seven. I can't really pause it. I can't really pay for what I need. I'm typically paying for an expensive SAN. So kind of moving on into that, kind of that realm of capabilities, we move into this concept of like a modern data warehouse. And this is where the, the, the hyperscalers and like the cloud vendors effectively came up with this more modern pattern where, um, I no longer have to do, you know, basically software upgrades. They give me an evergreen kind of software solution capability. They also give me elastic compute. And then when I need, you know, additional size, I can basically just kind of turn a knob or a widget, and then I get more compute. Um, it's still usually more 24 by seven. There's still not a lot of auto scaling in this world, but um, it, it's definitely better. But then I still have to combine this concept of like a data lake and a data warehouse. And so um, on the data lake side, again, like a very common and familiar pattern right now might be used to use like, um, Azure Data Factory to ingest the data and kind of land it in cloud storage. And then you might use Azure Data Factory to kind of uh, effectively load it from you know the data lake into uh, a, a more traditional uh, cloud data warehouse. Um, and, and then from there, you know the cloud data warehouse is actually allowing me to serve high concurrency and kind of low latency with high performance queries up to a semantic layer tool um, and then effectively reporting tools and so on and so forth. But again, even in this model, um, there's still multiple meta stores. We're still moving a lot of data around within places. There's no necessarily single version of the truth. And I have to do a lot of synchronization and copies. And so this just brings us more into this concept of like a semantic lake house. So the semantic lake house is really this new paradigm that really combines, you know, the data lake, the data warehouse, the semantic layer, A and BI, all into kind of like one tool set. And within that, it's going to be very familiar to what we we talked about on the lake house platform, right? Where there's open data storage formats. There's kind of like a singular governance model on top for cheap high performance storage. There's elastic compute uh, that's very high performant. There's there's uh, multiple compute options um, with, with auto termination and auto, auto scale out capabilities. You're gonna get enterprise effectively and self-service BI capabilities, either using import mode or direct query mode, all being served within that same architecture pattern. It's gonna be built with enterprise security with Azure Active Directory. And it's really going to kind of combine and, and provide this kind of unified experience all the way through the semantic layer and the reporting tools. 
And what that looks like today is effectively a combination of the Databricks Lake House plus Power BI. So we, we already reviewed you know, most of the Lake House components, but what we're going to drill in today is really this combination of using uh, Databricks SQL, which is actually a user persona experience within the Databricks Lake House, combined with Power BI to kind of create a truly uh, semantic Lake House capability um, without actually having to move the data into a, a more traditional relational database cloud data warehouse system. So um, again, like within Databricks SQL, we're going to be able to serve data up uh, directly against Delta tables on top of object storage uh, with really great performance and high concurrency and low latency. And then on the Power BI side, um, we're going to be able to have enterprise semantic layer capabilities literally with the analysis services tabular engine baked directly into, uh, into, the, into Power BI, where you can create composite models with direct query, um, with different import mode options, with user-defined aggregates um, that are going to provide a really good user experience and a true enterprise semantic layer capability. But then also we have self-service uh, business intelligence capabilities with Power BI Desktop. And within Power BI Desktop, there is a Databricks connector that seamlessly allows you to connect to Databricks SQL, uh, interact with your uh, your star schemas and your Delta Lake tables, and kind of serve that up for self-service analytics within Power BI. So um, for the rest of the presentation, um, again, we're going to try and cover some slides. I'll, I'll try and move a little bit faster because I think what most people would probably be interested is seeing a lot more demos. But we're going to do a kind of like a, a deep dive on Databricks SQL and then jump into effectively how you know, effectively Power BI kind of interacts with Databricks SQL. And then Kyle's got a bunch of awesome demos we're going to take a look at today as well. Um, Databricks SQL under the hood is, is really like a user persona for, for SQL and for business intelligence and data warehousing built directly into the Lakehouse platform. Um, I like to kind of like compile this into a couple of different experiences. So we already talked about the Delta Lake. We talked about Unity Catalog as kind of like that unified governance layer in a singular meta store um, for data engineering, for streaming, for data warehousing, and so on. Um, the SQL warehouses is, are really the compute engine within Databricks SQL. It's combined with Photon, that C++ vectorized engine, in order to give really fast uh, query performance directly on top of object storage. And then within that, we've got effectively an analyst experience. Uh, where you actually have a built-in SQL IDE directly into the into the Lakehouse application. Uh, there's an object explorer, very similar to SQL Server Management Studio, where I can see which catalogs, which databases and tables I have access to. I can drag around. I can type out my SQL queries. Um, it's got IntelliSense. Um, it's got autocomplete. It's got you know effectively you know error formatting for when I make an error. And then I can get my output of my queries. I can download the results. I can create you know, basic data visualizations, reports. I can build dashboards. I can create alerts. I can schedule refreshes. I can share those with my friends. Uh, the SQL warehouses provide um, effectively high, con concurrence, high concurrency and low latency compute with multiple compute options, meaning that I can, I can literally have multiple SQL warehouses up and running at the same time, all reading from the same Delta Lake tables. And they come with a bit effectively multi-cluster load balancing behind the scenes to where I can point users to a singular uh, Databricks SQL warehouse and behind the scenes, there could be multiple clusters actually answering those queries to serve a true high concurrency um, capability. And all that is wrapped around with effectively enterprise great security and performance with um, the ability to have role level security, column level security, and data masking kind of built into the tool set. Um, I, I know that like specifically, like some people have been a little bit skeptical of this, but Data Warehouse did, Databricks SQL did uh, win or beat the data warehousing speed test record at 100 terabytes. And effectively, this test was actually done by the Bar Barcelona Super Computing Center. And within that, um, they analyzed those results and did that testing um, with other cloud data warehouse providers, including Snowflake, which many consider as the, the best kind of cloud data warehouse mark on the, on the market. So you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, at 100 terabytes, uh, not only did Databricks uh, execute faster, but when compared to the other cloud data warehouse vendors, it provides a much better price performance ratio by orders of magnitude of, 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 of 12x. Um, and so obviously that's massive scale, right? Like uh, 100 terabytes is super huge and there's probably not a lot of companies out there that have 100 terabyte uh, size data warehouses. But on, you can see on the, on the graph on the right, at, at 10 gigabytes TPC DS, you know, when Databricks initially created Databricks SQL, from a high concurrency standpoint, it really wasn't that great. And you can see that by the red bar on the chart. By the, by the time the product got to you know past GA, it became very mature, and at 32 concurrent stream, 32 concurrent query streams, uh, Databricks SQL was able to provide you know higher query throughput uh, per hour than you know the, the cloud data warehouse three on the chart. So it's able to basically scale at really large data sets and provide really good high performance 
um, at, at good price performance ratios, and it's good at, at high concurrency small data as well. Um, the, the, if, if, you're, if you've started playing around with Databricks SQL before and you haven't like touched it in a good six months, on Azure, we just went to public preview with this concept of serverless uh, uh, serverless compute for Databricks SQL. And so within that, on the, on the screenshot, you can see it's just a radio button where you select service serverless, but it literally provides kind of instant kind of elastic SQL warehouses that spin up in fi five seconds. And engineering's working on trying to drop that even, even faster. And you can have auto termination uh, that's aggr aggressive up to a one minute um, in regards to if nobody's using that SQL warehouse, it'll just shut itself off. So you're no longer having to pay for a compute. Uh, with the serverless flavor, it automatically determines the instance types and the configuration for you for the best price performance. Again, that up to 12x um, improvement ratio, I'm, I'm saying again. It comes in with a uh, high concurrency built in with automatic load balancing and instant scale out because literally um, it's able to to, to uh, you know, effectively sense that that workload and that ramp up and workload and automatically scale out and add uh, clusters behind the scenes you know, effectively in that five second range. And then um, it comes with intelligent workload management features, you know, faster reads from cloud storage, and then also separate a complete separation of not only uh, compute and storage uh, from a more traditional sense, but a more uh, of a separation of ETL and data warehousing compute um, from a from an ETL perspective. And we'll review that in a little bit more in a second. Yeah, of course. So help me most. in this architecture fulfills the same role, similar role as Synapse serverless in the Microsoft architecture. So essentially we have files in the data lake or Delta Lake, but Photon is the engine that allows you to query these files, correct? And to, with SQL or- at, at speed and scale, yes. Okay, so that should be similar to Synapse, what Synapse serverless is trying to do, right? Correct. It's, they're they're very similar offerings. They're they're definitely uh, competing offerings. Um, Synapse Serverless is is literally a, a pay per use model, to where you like you you pay for a amount of like data that it actually read from file storage, and like it's, it's a very different uh, uh, consumption model. Databricks SQL is more traditional in that it fires up a compute engine. It uses Photon to effectively give you extremely high performing and fast queries at scale, um, and then you effectively when you don't need to compute anymore, you turn it off. Do you know, do you have a slide that compares them side by side, cost, uh, uh, speed? You can do some Google searching and you can find some people that have done some pretty explicit queries okay. on uh, TPCDS and things like that. Um, and it, but we're a, uh, you know, we're, we're an Azure partner and I don't want to, I don't want to say something know. bad about an Azure partner on a recorded meeting. So. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. Can I go there? Yeah, I, but, um, I was gonna say that. I was gonna say the same thing, just really quickly to, to cover that, right? Like, like so. Serverless offers a similar offering, but we really aren't designed for exactly the same use cases. Serverless is really, really good for exploratory data analysis. Like, I just have some tables in a file. I'm a data scientist. I just want to see them, but it's not really designed for high concurrency or really low level performance. So, just on speed basis, it's not really comparable. But it offers a totally different use case and serves. So they 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 have similar technologies, but they we we kind of execute because we're thinking of like longer term compute. We're really concerned about like lots of users doing lots of queries over long periods of time. Service designed around one user doing one compute at one specific time and doing those two things really well um, just requires different architecture. So they're not they're not a truly comparable. They do similar things in terms of the lake and compute on it, but but how they go about it is very different. So I don't want to put you on the spot here, Kyle, but um, you know, you mentioned you are a Microsoft partner and for this large customers like uh, Fortune 500 companies, do you guys recommend, suggest they stay only with the Databricks space or do you suggest architecture that actually has Databricks and Synapse at the same time? You know, how do you, how do you, how do you position these two technologies, right? Because <laughs> Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I mean, being blunt, uh, as as partners, we still go in and say, you know, Azure Databricks is a first party solution inside Azure. So we're happy to go sell Azure Databricks and therefore Azure um, to customers. We we don't feel you need a Snaps dedicated pool for most scenarios. Um, and and we're we're happy to tell customers that and talk about around some of those pain points. Some of the things that you're seeing right here around serverless and high concurrency, some of the things on this slide, 
um, really speak to some of the challenges that you actually face with Synapse. I'm, I'm happy to demo them in a few minutes. Um, but, um, you know, we, we, we say that to customers. Now, um, you know, Microsoft obviously has a different position on that. Um, we're trying to educate them on that because honestly, like Snowflake has a really better architecture than, than Synapse as well. Uh, and they're a, a deep competitor of both of ours. So sometimes the enemy of your enemy is your friend. And, and when Microsoft, we do partner together um, to go beat Snowflake, it's almost always leading with Databricks in the lake house, not, uh, not bringing Synapse into the picture because Synapse really isn't uh, commercially competitive with Snowflake, uh, whereas Databricks SQL is. So um, I, that's kind of a, I'll try to be a little diplomatic here, but um, we as Databricks uh, typically don't leave with Synapse, but we are happy to kind of get out of the way if Microsoft wants that in their account. We don't, we don't go fight over every workload for every use case, so. Thanks, Kyle. We'll like, uh, we use that. Uh, also, the context is useful here. Like, if the whole farm is data factory, you know, with that interface, and they want to write PySpark code, maybe Synapse is the right one to get into there where they know, okay, I can drag and drop, I can kill create the flows, pipelines, because I have X number of uh, years of ADF experience. But uh, working in data factory, uh, data bricks rather, we settle down with that platform. We get it, everything over there. Now, I don't get everything because I work for military uh, data. You know, we have GCC high, so we don't have DB uh, data bricks SQL. We don't have partner connect. You don't have a lot of things. I'm it's, it's, it's in the roadmap, and you're, you're talking about like Azure, Azure government. It's, it's uh, always yeah, it is. It's always behind. It's always behind for yeah. sure. And Azure uh, government, Gov Cloud data. Uh, I'm using Power BI connecting Databricks using uh, the data lake connector because we can't use Databricks connector. So, so you're just connecting direct, directly to Delta Lake files. Using uh, from Azure using AD uh, authentication. ADLS to AD, directly to ADLS Gen 2, right? Yes. Yeah, and that's that's possible. Yeah, and staying within the GCP high or government cloud connector because we can't go out, we can't get anything. Else. Yeah, that makes sense. You're pretty limited there in regards to a lot of that capabilities. I know it is long time when I will be seeing it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but this serverless is this. The one that when we start up the Databricks, it takes four minutes or five minutes to spin up the server. Right now it's five seconds. The serverless. Correct. So is it there in the data uh, in the data engineering compute also? This is the Databricks SQL compute, right? But is it there in the... It's, it's coming there soon. So uh, effectively, Databricks is going to be creating serverless offerings across all the different user personas. So then the next persona that's going to be getting... Well, I say that... The, the, there's Databricks SQL serverless that's that's uh, effectively in public preview on Azure Databricks. Um, we just released a serverless real-time model inferencing capability that's actually in public preview and should be going to GA extremely soon. And so that's literally the ability to like serve uh, basically uh, machine learning models via REST API endpoints to like to your mobile phone applications and things like that at extremely high scale. Um, so that's that's out right now. Uh, the next serverless offering that's going to be that's actually in private preview right now is. Uh, through uh, jobs and workflows. So you'd be able to cr basically create a Databricks job and actually run your compute using a serverless uh, Databricks runtime uh, cluster that kind of effectively pops up, you know, really, really quickly and then expires once you finish your job. And then the final like serverless endpoint will be all purpose compute at some point in the future as well. We can still use, I mean, in government cloud, I mean, I know commercial cloud has a lot of additional stuff there. We don't even have DLT. Okay? Got it. We have to live with that. We can't complain about it. But uh, the thing is, uh, we still have job cluster in the government cloud where it spins up job. And yeah. Goes away. The only downside here is every time the server comes up, you have to wait for four minutes, five minutes, and then job clusters. Yeah, I mean, the it, serverless is interesting. Well, especially when you've played with serverless and you experience the effectively almost instant, near instant startup, it's hard to go back. Yeah. But yeah, hopefully, hopefully soon. Um, within Databricks SQL, again, like we kind of already talked about it a second ago, but literally there's an IDE built directly into the Databricks um, SQL kind of user persona uh, where it's, you know, it's ANSI SQL compliant. Uh, you're able to ingest data directly from, from object storage into Databricks SQL this way as well. Again, you can create queries. You can share them with your friends. You can do some light data visualization. You can create dashboards. You can share those with other users. You can schedule refreshes, create alerts, and things like that. It's not... 
it's definitely not anywhere near the capability of what you're going to find in a true enterprise reporting tool like Power BI or Tableau. So it's just it's just not that. But it, it is built directly into the ID and into the interface, and it makes it very convenient. Um, more from a DBA perspective, there's this concept of like the admin experience. So literally, you can go into the Databricks SQL query history, and as an admin, you can actually go into the SQL warehouses themselves as well. On the SQL warehouse side, you can literally see um, you know, how many can how many queries are kind of like getting executed at different uh, increments, how many uh, queries are potentially queued, has the SQL warehouse actually scaled up and down from a multi-cluster load balancing capability. Uh, and then um, within the analyst experience as well, you can go into the query history, you can see the individual queries that have executed across all the SQL warehouses. You can drill down into the individual SQL, uh, SQL queries. You can look at the execution plan. You can see you know, potentially why it's slow or fast or whatever, um, and, and effectively you know, Im improve those and continue improving the experience. Uh, and then one of the things that I, I find is really cool, um, you know, from a compute perspective, you know, for a long time, like if you're using an Azure SQL database or you're using a, a more traditional cloud data warehouse, when you're actually running your ETL, you're actually competing with your data warehousing queries and your data warehousing users. But in the in the Lakehouse platform, that's just not the case. So I can literally have multiple SQL warehouses up and running at the same time, serving different groups of users, all tapping into the same um, effectively star schema with my dimensions, my fact tables, my user defined aggregates. At the same time, I can literally have a streaming cluster loading those that same dimensional model in real time using a streaming pattern while my queries are actually querying those tables um, in an ad hoc manner in the SQL warehouse and they're not conflicting because of the asset transactions so everything just kind of keeps up with it keep with it, uh, keeps up with itself and you're not having that con that conflicting kind of ram cpu and concurrency cycles on the more traditional cloud data warehouse compute and then um getting ready to hand it over to kyle but you absolutely can do data warehousing on databricks sql um, it supports primary keys and four key constraints. It has identity columns, um, and you can enforce check constraints. There's computed columns capabilities. Um, you know, there was a lot of skepticism on the medallion architecture kind of the last time you, you, we, you know, we talked about it in the last presentation. But at the end of the day, it's really not that much different than like what we used to do on premise. So in our bronze and our raw zone, we would literally just kind of stage the data and almost create a replication of those source systems, more for lineage and also reloading purposes. It ends up being write optimized and we kind of organize it by different source systems. So very similar to what I used to build on on-premise data warehouses. And then in silver, again, this is gonna be, your mileage is gonna vary. It, it, you're going to structure it how you need it to be structured to meet your business requirements. But this can be an operational data store. This can be a data vault. This could be some type of normalized kind of second normal form like uh, structure. Um, this could be your integration layer. Again, it's still gonna be write optimized. But again, like thinking back to like a Bill Inman architecture, this is where my my more of my um, second normal form style lake house or, or data warehouse might actually live. And then finally, like goal is really going to be my presentation layer. So this is where I'm going to create my solution data sets. My star schema is going to uh, live here, and we're going to make it read optimized. So within the Delta Lake storage format, definitely you know another session. But Patrick mentioned it um, as well. But there's the concept of optimize and Z order. Z ordering is literally like a clustered index that I can put on top of my Delta Lake tables. Um, other use cases might be you know, reporting tables or machine learning feature tables that are you know, really, really wide, have a lot of attributes, or maybe it's a data science sandbox, or maybe my, my data mesh architecture kind of lives in the gold zone as well. And then um, you know, finally, before we kind of start talking more about Power BI and the semantic layouts again, um, building like dimensions of back tables in Databricks SQL is extremely similar, and, and it's gonna be a lot like you're gonna experience in a more traditional SQL Server database. So you can see here in my syntax, I'm just you know, creating a table. My loan surrogate key is big int generated always as identity, um, and it's a primary key. I can use you know uh, basically Spark data types, or I can use more traditional SQL Server data types like like decimal and varchar. Um, I have got computed columns in this statement, um, and I can even create you know null and not null constraints. I can even create you know constraints on columns and maybe check the, uh, the integrity of, a, of of data quality as it's coming in, and then. Um, Within the data lake world, a lot of times um, and historically you used to have to do a lot of like manual partitioning of the data in order to get good performance, and that's just not the case anymore. Um, Kyle, you, maybe you could tell if it's if it's a gigabyte or what the the size threshold is. But uh, with Delta Lake Storage Fat, we we actually typically don't recommend partitioning the data manually unless it's it's really super huge. And then uh, another thing that came up in the last presentation that I just wanted to kind of emphasize is that. Um, 
when you create Delta Lake tables and like surface those through Databricks SQL, if it's like a string type and it's like super huge and there's actually not a constraint on the string size, Databricks SQL doesn't care. Like it's just, it's still fast. Like you don't have to analyze your string lengths and make it a varchar 10 and, you know, go back in time because now we're at like a 50 or 100 and like change your, change your column data type. Like you just don't have to do that. You just make it a string and it performs fast and it's quick. Cool. I'm gonna uh, stop sharing my slides, Kyle. I'll let you. Uh... Oh, I was gonna make you run the slides. You mind? Just it's just oh, yeah, a few slides in the demo. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Fantastic. So for, first, great presentation, Leo. So far, I just wanna like like this top on top of this specifically about Power BI with with Azure Databricks. So um, we do have a first class Power BI integration. We have a native connector in there to Databricks SQL warehouses. You can still connect to traditional clusters as well, but obviously we're here today to talk about Databricks SQL. Um, we offer enterprise security in Azure Databricks. We have native integration with Azure AD. We have support for table ACLs, obviously, inside our own product, uh, support for row and column level security and data masking. Um, we can support self-service and enterprise BI usage directly from the, the data lake storage with enterprise performance. And, you know, of course, what that means is that, you know, you can have top down, which is usually where most companies come from, from a Databricks SQL. We're putting our enterprise data warehouse our corporate data sets and building canonical Power BI data sets, deploying them out, certifying and endorsing them, sharing them with our big wide audience of Power BI users. But you can also have, you know, a set of power users who are connecting to the gold or even the silver level um, and bringing in those data sets and using Power BI as a visualization and analytical layer, sharing those inside business teams, uh, moving right to left, right? Like where they're going from prototyping data sets into those enterprise models you know, being upsized in there as well. We support those as well. Um, we do have flexible storage options inside Power BI, and we're one of the few you know, few connectors that can take advantage of things like direct query and composite models, as we'll kind of see. Uh, and then the last piece is we have a, a special concept called Cloud Fetch. Really, all it means is, especially when you're doing imports, but even just large scale direct query um, like big tables. Uh, what it means is we can actually ship the data from Databricks SQL down to your Power BI client, whether it's your machine and desktop or the Power BI services that are doing uh, refreshes on, the, on a scheduled basis, we can send that data over very, very quickly so that Power BI can focus on just importing that data. So we're able to move that data uh, really quickly across the wire to, to your client. Um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. And so uh, we mentioned earlier, dimensional modeling totally support on Databricks SQL. Obviously, Roach's Maxim still applies in Power BI. Star schemas are best long, skinny, flat, you know, fact tables are ideal. We're based on a columnar storage system as well, so we totally support it. You know, we have our own kind of, you know, um, love for, for columnar systems. Uh, of course, you can model other ways. Flat tables sometimes make sense, especially with big data systems uh, and third-party systems where you don't control over it. Um, we don't recommend kind of over-indexing on uh, dimensional modeling every single time. We, we kind of call it, I call it the Goldilocks approach, right? Just what's right for you. Um, one of the things you can do is you could definitely degenerate more dimensions into your fact table, um, especially if they're infrequently accessed. Uh, and that's a really good pattern to, you know, d again, d Databricks itself doesn't care about querying against that, but you can get better performance by reducing joins um, in every system. Um, so it's not unique to us, but it's one that, that we kind of call out that, you know, like trying to get that right blend ultimately between managing the actual data from a right performance perspective and then a read performance, star scheme is still the best in the business. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so the storage modes, uh, hopefully you're familiar with Power BI. They have import mode. That's imported into memory in Power BI. Obviously, it's going to be the fastest speed. We don't compete with that in any way. But the downside is, you know, the data freshness is only as fresh as your latest refresh. And if you do have gigabytes or sometimes terabytes of data, like many of our customers do, um, it's either not possible or not feasible or too expensive. Uh, to bring that data into import mode. Uh, and so Power BI has this really great capability of direct query um, where you're able to leave your data behind in your source system like Databricks SQL, just tell Power BI what your metadata is inside there uh, and then let the Power BI engine when you create a visual uh, and use DAX underneath, translate that using our driver to SQL, we're, um, satisfy that query on our end and bring that data back into a visual or set of visuals. Um, obviously, the Power BI speed there is not going to be as fast. We are, we like to say it's fast, but it's not going to be as fast as in memory. But the data is as fresh as your data source. So if you add new data, like like uh, like Leo was showing earlier, if you're streaming new data into that 
uh, underlying fact table and you hit refresh in Power BI, you're going to see that data right away. Uh, and it kind of balances that that cost or, or, or feasibility of putting infrequently accessed data uh, into Power BI. It gives you really great uh, ability to leave that behind uh, and only access it as needed on this kind of ad hoc basis uh, and still get good enough performance. Um, the last piece is dual mode. If you actually go to the next slide, um, we'll kind of talk about dual mode a little more. So again, recommendations for how to use these storage modes is again that large fact table, leaving it behind a direct query. Sometimes you have to, sometimes it usually makes the most sense. Um, but for aggregation tables, uh, summary tables in your composite model, we definitely recommend uh, if your data is not being updated very frequently using import mode. If it is still in real time, you can use direct query, but still on an aggregation. So you can actually materialize that aggregation table inside Databricks SQL, and then still reason over a lot less uh, rows in your data set. And then dual mode is usually reserved for dimension tables. So especially when you're combining large fact table and direct query, aggregate tables and import mode, dimension tables being in dual mode, which means you bring your data into Power BI and you tell it, uh, I have this table behind in Databricks SQL, lets Power BI have that optionality to satisfy uh, a DAX visual um, using either the tables in the direct query system, Databricks SQL, or the data that's in import mode. And it doesn't have to, you don't have to bring them in separately or manage them independently. You can just manage them all in one single table in one way. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide. Uh, so aggregate tables, hopefully you guys are familiar again with these with Power BI, but they're really, really, I would say in some ways required um, if you're using Databricks SQL uh, in Power BI. And the real reason is, is really user experience. You can do everything in direct career. We have users who do this, but honestly, you're just throwing away a great capability that you get with Power BI. Uh, you're just throwing away a thing you're paying for on the table. So an aggregate table, is a hidden table behind a fact table that is aggregated view of that same fact table. So in this case, on the left in this example, we've got driver activity. It includes latitude and longitude, and the actual timestamps for our create date and activity date are at the second in grain. So every 15 seconds, this data is being recorded into this table for a bunch of fleets of drivers. It's a lot of data. Um, what we can do is we can take that same data and roll it up. So we can roll the dates up to one hour grains, and we can remove latitude and longitude and just roll up to um, a, a county or a city position, right? So not that fine level of granularity, but obviously much less data. Sometimes literally, you know, as we'll see in the demo, like a million times less data. Um, and then what you're able to do is because it's a hidden table, your users don't care, they don't see it, they don't know it exists, but when they build a Power BI visual that can be satisfied with that hidden table, uh, it can work work faster because it has to work on less data. And then when they go reach out to be a drill through or tool tips, or they just create a visual that uses that low level granularity, um, then it can fall back to that big level table. And actually this is really powerful on top of that because as a Power BI report developer, you can actually create navigational analysis between those summary tables and those details. So by defining what type of analysis your customers are doing from that summary level to that detail level, you can define these tables and give them a really great uh, user experience and performance. Go ahead to the next slide, uh, Leo. Um, hybrid tables work in the same way. You can take a single table uh, and partition it, uh, usually by time, almost always by time. Uh, and you can have one special partition, which is direct query. That's obviously usually your latest you know, granularity, in this case, the day. So today's data is in real time. Uh, and your historical data is in import mode. Um, you can roll those up in obviously old years. You can roll them up to a very high level of granularity. And as you move closer and closer, you have you know typical rolling partitions. Uh, in this case, with you know quarter, month, and down to the last three days, which are being incrementally refreshed. You can put these all into a single table. Again, your users don't see this, don't care. Uh, they just want to know that the number at the bottom when they click and do all their slicing uh, gives them those those great row counts. Um, so, okay, uh, I'm going to switch over to a demo. Or is there one more slide and then demo? Oh, so last piece, composite models. You can combine all of these things together into one nice model in Power BI, create a really awesome capability Power BI. So you can blend these things to give yourself the right user experience for the right data set, for the right type of analysis that your users want to do. Um, and you can get to choose all these different options. Sometimes it's totally better to import everything. Sometimes leave everything in direct query. Most of the times composite models with aggregates and hybrid tables make the most sense to, to blend between user experience, performance, and cost. Okay, now I'm on a demo? Yeah, yeah. okay, sweet. Okay, cool. Let's let's do a demo. Um, all right, um, let me do a demo. Okay, let me um, warm this up for one second, and then we'll, uh, we'll get going. Okay, 
So what we have here, um, first off, if you've never used a, a Power BI to get data, um, again, data Power, Power BI supports a ton of different connectors. Um, if you come in here and go get data, and I always just type bricks because that's the way because everything's called data. Not many things are called bricks. Uh, we have both an Azure Databricks native connector, and this is the connector if you use AWS or GCP Databricks. So you can use this. We have an OAuth connector if you're not using Azure AD as your, your authentication as well. So you have these two connectors. Uh, once you connect through from here, um, you can go and start to navigate our, our catalog of data. So in this case, we've um, we've we've connected to uh, you know again a particular uh, warehouse that's running uh, in here, and we can actually navigate. Um, this is actually the flattened version of it, but you can actually uh, also do it by, by catalog and then schema and then tables. This is just just at the schema level. Um, so we can come in here, see the uh, individual catalogs, individual schemas, choose an individual table, uh, bring that data in again in import or direct query mode. Um, you can then from here, you can actually do transformations on top of this, even in direct query mode. We support most push down. My, my general rule of thumb is if it looks like a SQL query, you can do it. So for example, if we want to filter something out, uh, no problem, we can just say, hey, just remove everything um, where the pickup hour is not equal to 17. You'll see that filter gets applied. And then what happens is, because um, this is on the back end, let me go refresh this. Um, is, so this is Databricks SQL. Um, this is actually the, the query we just ran. Uh, just ran right in here, and we can see that it actually generates a query on the fly to filter out that pickup hour equals 17, and it will use this going forward for our Power Query refresh. So this generated query can be you know, generated using steps uh, in the Power Query UI. Um, you typically don't necessarily want to do as a ton of, of, you can, of course, but you typically would probably want to put this and do this as part of an ETL job uh, and record it there. But for self-service users, this is pretty convenient. So again, you can do things like filter, select columns. Um, you can do most of the transformations that flit up here. Not every single one is what we would call uh, foldable. So that can be translated into a SQL query. Um, but if you don't do that, like if you pick transpose or something up here, um, we just do fill down, I think. Um, it'll tell you like, oh, this isn't supported and it's just gonna probably kind of throw all kinds of fits about this um, because this thing is not filled down all the way. But um, but it'll basically complain and be like, hey, this isn't supported in direct query mode. You're gonna have to switch to import mode if you wanna if you wanna do this. And and um, so we'll just we won't do it for now. But it'll actually tell you, hey, this isn't supported in here. Um, so from here we've got uh, direct query um, as support. We also have a table that's been imported, which is an aggregate table in here as well. Okay, so um, for just for the sake of time, we're just gonna kind of go and say, hey, we've already built this model. But let's go take a quick at the look at the model just in case and kind of make sure we're we're all tracking along. So this is a traditional star schema model. Uh, we have this fact table in direct query mode. That's our trips table. So it's all the New York City taxi data set, standard everywhere. We built it into um, Databricks has its own uh, data sets we ship with. This is one of them. So we have a, a trips table. It comes with what well, location was the trip in for both pickup and drop off. Obviously it's got uh, a payment type. It's got some rate code information and it's got a timestamp on when the trip occurred. Uh, we also have an import table, uh, which is a trip summary. And really quickly, uh, let's go look at this trip summary table. So the trip summary table is the trips table, but rolled up to a date grain. So in each trip, obviously we have the individual timestamp by the borough instead of latitude, longitude, and then it's rolled up these three aggregates. And you'll notice that this data set, while the original trips table has 300 million rows in it, this data set only has 7,000 rows in it. So one, you know, using this aggregation table in our query, if users use the data in this analysis for their visuals, they're going to get really great performance because we've imported this in and it's a fairly small data set. And then when they're no longer satisfied by that and they need to go further, they can fall back to that, that 300 million row set. So by bringing this in, um, this isn't a hidden aggregation table because there's a many to many relationship between borough and I haven't created the, the bridge table between them. So for now, this is just many to many and we just leave this table here and build analysis on top of this. But you could create this bridge table, hide this table and make it associated here. So the user would only interface with the trips table, but if they chose borough by date and chose trip count, it would satisfy it using this table. Um, okay, so uh, here in the this table, so as we'll see, uh, all this analysis on this uh, this page is a summary view. It's all leveraging that uh, summary table. And so you'll notice that because it's imported, uh, performance here is really, really fast, right? Like if I choose a different month, I choose a different date, uh, you know, I bring all this stuff in, um, this stuff's gonna be really, really fast. And that's because this is all just operating over 
that very small 8,000 row table in memory Power BI. Great. Um, what happens though is that we want to start with, you know, from this 300 million row analysis, let's say this is exactly the analysis I want to look at. I want to look at Wednesdays in May of 2018 and, and, and Mondays and say, what's going on in Brooklyn? Uh, and now I want to go and get a little more finer view of this data set. Well, I can do that by doing things like a tooltip report. So in this case, we're hovering over here now. And now this tooltip report is all being generated on the fly in Databricks SQL. So we're actually now able to go from Brooklyn, uh, it's just kind of a borough, into the individual latitude and longitudes of all the different pickup zones. Uh, and we're able to see aggregate stats beyond just trip count and distance and fare. We're able to see average tip and average duration in minutes and average passengers. Uh, and we can do this, you know, so what we've done is we've gone from, you know, 300 million rows of aggregate analysis uh, that we're looking at here uh, into, uh, you know, we start with 300 million rows. Oh, I'm sorry, we got more things clicked on. So 301 million rows of selected data. What we want the users to do is go, hmm, I'm actually only interested in Manhattan and I'm only maybe interested in uh, the weekends. Uh, and maybe I'm only interested in the, you know, a particular calendar year as well, right? And so by slicing this data set down, uh, we go from 300 million to 20 million, much more reasonable set of data. And now when we come and hover over this, uh, we're not having to re reason over all that data set. We can apply those filters and pull back a much smaller data set. Uh, we're able to go one step further, right? And go from here and actually drill through. Uh, and so in this case, we can, oh, um, well, actually, where is, oh, uh, yeah, so hold on one second. Let me make sure this is exactly what I thought. One second is, uh, it's funny. What's going on with this one? Something in this expression it does not like. Let me just remove the tilt. No. Well, that's a bummer. Um, let's see what's going on here. Latitude, longitude, everything's good. I'm going to look at it for one more second. I'm going to give up on it. It doesn't quite matter what it is per se. It's just like you can just use it as an additional slicer. So um, in this case, like we'll just kind of we'll just won't worry about it here because clearly something's going on on this on this side. I'm 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 considering like rebuilding it on the fly, but uh, maybe it's just one of these extra filters down here. No, it doesn't matter. Okay, it doesn't matter. So in this case, we can go from that, again, that, that 20 million row view that we had um, of, of things that are dropping off in Manhattan. Um, and we can come and just choose, you know, again, even further, we can go in and, and really kind of go pin down, you know, specific details. I want to see individual trips uh, that are happening on certain days and certain boroughs and certain zones. Um, I'm really curious about like, you know, filtering this down and only looking at um, particular pickup zones, right? And just seeing the information that's available here. Um, and so, you know, we're really able to move back and forth between this summary view and this kind of aggregate view in Databricks SQL by, by using this filter, this summarize filter, and then drill down and drill through. I apologize, this extra filter is not showing up. It's just the same map on the other side, but from the, the pickup side. So, um, so that I just first, I like, just want to kind of like set the bar here for like good modeling inside Power BI is really, really critical. Um, you really want to have that aggregate table to help people move from 300 million rows, 300 billion rows of analytical data down to something that's more manageable and something that they want to go and explore further. Um, and by doing so, you know, that's what's going to give them that really great performance when they then go down and say, hey, I'm actually, now that I found something interesting in the pattern, I want to see the details underneath. Um, so yeah, so the, the last piece I want to talk about here is just kind of like the, maybe the elephant in the room is like, how do we stack up against cloud data warehouses? Um, so this is uh, this same data set is actually also uh, available in Synapse. I have it on a 6,000 uh, DWC um, server right now, uh, which goes for $72 an hour list in the East US um, versus this medium endpoint, which is $16 an hour on, on Databricks. Um, and we'll notice that if we select an individual kind of, um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of, if we change the dates, you don't see the maps change, you see the kind of numbers, but you'll notice that like, you, you know, one, if you want to try to guess which one is which, you know, good luck. Um, they, they're pretty they're pretty competitive on individual queries, which is kind of, you know, no caching, no kind of like extra bid on this. This is just kind of like, this is just performance all up using a shared filter and saying, okay, just generate a map and generate this. And you may say like, okay, well, so we've seen now that they kind of have similar performance. That's good to know on an OLAP front. Like I'm able to serve queries out of here, um, kind of like filter around, get different data sets and you can see them kind of compete. But there's a, there's another side to this story. And this is where we're talking about the power of the lake house. So what I have here is a script uh, that's written in Python, uh, and it generates actually the same eight queries that we saw here on the summary page. So this is this is eight visuals. You'll just have to trust me on that. Um, I've extracted out the queries that got generated from that, and we just apply some random filters to it. And the random filters are the borough, and then the a week, a random week 
out of our data set. And what we do is we actually simulate this for 20 users at a time, uh, and we try to ship them all off. And then we do that um, 30 times in a row just to give myself enough duration during this demo. Uh, and what we're going to do is actually, oh, and um, we're going to start kicking these off against um, both Synapse and Databricks at the same time. So each one of these uh, threads is doing that same thing. So when we're all done, if I get to, let me click through and we'll talk about this. But uh, while we're doing this, um, we're essentially kicking off about 2,500 queries uh, at the same time for each of these things. And then not only that, but we're actually not gonna stop until um, they've done through that 30 times. So each it's 2,560 queries, um, and then each one is being generated kind of over and over again. Um, and so these queries you'll notice, um, you know, as each one of these lines comes through with this little exclamation mark, that's a query that got returned to a user uh, in one of these threads. And so we can kind of see there's eight sets here. We've got eight sets here on this side. Uh, let me make sure, oh, oh, get them all running. Um, same thing on Synapse. We've got this one running as well. Uh, and then make sure that this one is running as well. Okay. Okay, so we have these all running in here. And so this is spinning up a wild amount of queries at the same time against both our Databricks SQL endpoint uh, and our Synapse endpoint. And what we'll see uh, very, very quickly is that, you know, one of them really starts to sputter. Um, and the reason it starts to sputter is because it can't handle that level of concurrency. Uh, and hopefully it's no spoilers on um, kind of which one is which at this point, because we are here to make a case. But um, you know, like this, this sputtering that's happening here on the right side on the Synapse side is real. Um, it's that this user, when we select different values, um, you know, we're you know, Databricks SQL is able to spin up additional concurrency to resolve this query for this user. So imagine this is a user who doesn't know that these 2,500 queries, you know, are running on their backend system. They don't need to know. They don't care. This Synapse user, they care a lot because they're sitting there watching this thing spurn going, I thought I was paying $72 an hour for this machine. Why is this thing so slow? And the answer is like, hey, the, again, query by query performance, uh, Synapse is as fast as anybody. But when you start to add in this extra bit of, of caching that goes on and, and needs to be reconciled between these two systems, um, what happens is that over time, uh, you know, this, this, uh, these 25 or 60 queries really just starts to lay into this. And if we go see kind of the real impact on this, it's it's that it's this piece right here. So if we go to the SQL warehouses on our side, and we go to the shared endpoint, and we go and and monitor this, and we'll see that you'll notice that uh, as we started to push in all these queries, a bunch of them were queued inside Databricks SQL. So we noticed that we didn't have enough compute to satisfy all of the users who were putting queries into the system. So it was able to very quickly spin up and say, "Give me two more clusters." And you'll notice that I kind of spin up one of these like a little bit earlier. I go back the last seven days, you can see some of these spikes that I've been doing uh, as testing, but you can see that as we hit these big query performance spikes, we're able to bring in five, 10, 15 clusters worth of performance. And I wanna be really clear, this costs money. This costs money because you know this, each one of these machines is $16 an hour. And so as you move up to you know this like window where we were up at 15 for a few minutes, um, you'll notice that like you know, you're spending at that point several hundred dollars an hour on your compute. But when we're done, we very quickly get rid of that compute. We realize, hey, the, the hard times are over and we give all that compute back and you're back to a stable state relatively quickly. Like within the hour, you're back to three or four systems, you know, back at the, the price that you were expecting to pay for your steady state BI workloads. Um, so this additional compute costs money. Let's just say, you know, maybe it even costs net net close to a thousand extra dollars. Um, whereas that $72 an hour machine on data on Studio SQL or Synapse to be fair, uh, isn't really going up in price. But what you're happening, what you're actually paying for, and I want to be really clear, is you're paying for users' time. When your user is sitting here watching these things spin um, while they're getting their data sets over here and your other users are watching this, you're paying for this person to sit here and wait and watch these numbers. Uh, and these numbers, like, you know, if we count up the waiting of 2,500 queries being run by 20, you know, 20 different users running 100 queries, doing that 30 times in a row, and we add those up and just say, hey, these are, $100 an hour resources that are just being paid for their time, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars before this set, this data set users will be just sitting here watching numbers kind of roll to their fold. You know, like you're going to sit there and watch, you know, the Databricks users get on with their business. They got their answer. They moved on. They don't care that you spend an extra thousand dollars of compute to make that happen so that these hundreds of users are satisfied. You know, satisfied. What they really care about is this. 
Uh, and so we really want to talk about when we talk about concurrency and what the lakehouse capabilities, it's not just query by query performance, although we feel we go pound for pound. Um, it's this it's this notion right here that we can scale the concurrency you need. We can do it very, very economically, and then we can give back that compute when you're done. And you don't have to reason with any of this uh, in your cloud data warehouse at all. So we really think the lake house is like a, a perfect complement to Power BI. Uh, and we really think like we can provide really, really great performance, really great experience for your users inside here. Uh, and frankly, like cloud data warehouses, for the most part, this is this is the experience users are are used to when they're talking about direct query uh, over the lake, you know, with with lots of uh, concurrent users. So uh, that's really it for my demo. Uh, I'll take any questions. Hopefully, um, it's a, a good point for for questions. About Synapse Server Mess or Synapse SQL that you use for the demo? And I apologize, Leo. Can you repeat the questions? I, I can't hear was that, in the room. Sorry. Was that Synapse Serverless or Synapse Dedicated SQL Pools? Oh no, so this is Synapse Dedicated Pools. Um, again, I'll, I'll be like as clear as I can. Synapse Serverless doesn't even compete in this space at all. Synapse Serverless has no concept of caching. So one of the examples is, is for example, is um, if the same user does run the exact same query uh, in here, um, we're actually able to satisfy that in Databricks with a cache. Synapse Serverless doesn't have that capability, so it'd have to redo all of the joins of our dimensional model, pull all of that from the lake all over again, um, and, and redo that compute. So it's not even really comparable for doing things like hundreds of users using a system where most of the analysis is repetitive re analysis on top of the same dashboard report. So same model, same types of queries. The only things that are changing might be the filters of the boroughs, the times, or you know, kind of the individual dimensional attributes. Um, we're gonna we're gonna get really great performance there. So. Hey, now can you clarify what you mean by cache, by the way? Because when I hear cache, you know, sometimes as a user, I might say like, you're talking about the query result cache. I'm talking about the exact same query over and over again. So what do you mean by cache? Yeah, yeah, I know it's a really great question. That's it. That it so we actually have two types of cache inside the the Databricks SQL warehouse. Um, maybe we'll kind of catch one if I can catch one on the on the road here. So what we do mean is that, yeah, if you run this exact, here's a perfect example. You notice it marks cache. So what it says is that 1.1 of our users, again, because I'm randomly generating the users. So this particular filter, September, or the you know week nine, 2019 in Manhattan, had already been run previously. So we're able to actually go just retrieve the results of the last user query. So we verify that they still have access. We verify the data hasn't changed. And if that's true, instead of rerunning the query, we just pull actually, we store the values of those queries and we just retrieve it using a hash lookup. Um, and so you'll see that that runs very, very quickly versus um, if we had to run this without a cache, it would probably order more in the order of one second or so for this type of query. So that's the query result cache. Um, separate from that, we do also have a, a disk cache. So again, we pull data from object storage, but while this disk, this, this particular warehouse is up, it has disks attached to it. Um, and we're able to actually go and store data that's um, in our disks uh, from object storage into that warehouse. And so you can see this particular query didn't have to go back to your data lake because it already knows that, hey, people are hitting this same set of data from the lake over and over again. I'm going to leave it in my cache. And so these individual tables for the date, the raw yellow trips, they don't have to go back to object storage to achieve it. It just needs to reason over that data on the disks. So Kyle, what happens if the data gets updated on uh, the object storage from like a, a streaming cluster? Um, what what yeah, will the data yeah, exactly. do? Yeah, so in this case, this number would not be 100%. It would be like 95%. And it would, it would have to go and retrieve that additional 5% that it doesn't have. So it knows on based off the delta table that we're hitting, or in this case, a bunch of delta tables, uh, it knows based off the snapshot which files are the delta between what it has on disk and what it doesn't. It'll go retrieve that and append it to here uh, and then do that analysis. So you won't get that cache experience anymore because it'll invalidate the query result cache. You'll still get the benefit of having most of this data cached on disk, uh, and you'll still get great performance because you actually can reason all of those still in a distributed fashion. So it basically can run the same query against that new data set and just join it to your old data set in a distributed fashion. So it doesn't have to go and like kind of start all over again every single time. Very, really powerful. Is it smart enough to take that 5% and also add it to the SSDs? Uh, it is, yeah. So it, when it does this, it does it very, um, we'll call it greedy. It's got a very greedy algorithm. Um, it basically will throw everything on it can onto those disks. Uh, each one of those, uh, a medium endpoint contains uh, 16 disks of 128 gigs. Uh, for those who are doing the math at home, it's about 1.4 terabytes. Um, so it, it's you know definitely pulling in uh, a couple of gigs of data like the, uh, the Power BI Taxi data set. Uh, no brainer for it to do so.
Yeah, great questions. Uh, what what other questions are out there? Let's see. There were so many questions here. I don't want to. Yeah, I wanted to ask. Uh, in an effort to optimize your user experience, but you said you oh, if it reaches capacity, it will sit there and spin, and the user will sit there and wait. Is there a way you can predict or at least set parameters that will let you know that if you reach a certain threshold of usage, that you can go ahead and just automatically spin up and you're sort of preemptive in your ability to spin up another uh, uh, another instance? Yeah, oh, fantastic. Yeah, fantastic you have fantastic questions. So we actually have that all <laughs> we yeah, we have the yeah, I heard the question this time. Great, thanks. Yeah. Um so we actually have that baked into the product. So here's the example. This is the shared endpoint. So it's a single endpoint that all of our users can access, whether they're using Power BI, ODBC, client applications, Tableau, Spotfire, you know, whatever they want to access to it. In this case, we'll pretend they're only doing Power BI. Um, and you're able to set these uh, parameters right here. So how many clusters do we start with, uh, as well as how many clusters will we be allowed to scale up to? And this is really more of a budget or a um, you know, comfort level with scale. We really do, and I, I mean, I say this you know, as the vendor, we encourage you to set this number as high as possible. And it's not because like, oh, you spin up 2,000, you're going to spin up 2,000 clusters. In fact, it's very rare for any users of our system ever to really get to like double digit clusters. Actually, the scenario that I'm doing is an extreme scenario for most of our customers. They're usually hitting like six, seven, eight clusters at most in those spiky workloads and then coming back down. But we do encourage you to set this as high as as you feel comfortable because you will be charged for this. So we don't want people to like get away with thinking that, you know, hey, it's free. But we automatically look at the workload that's coming in and do all of that scaling for you. So that 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 um, that earlier that little I call this the grocery cashier curve. I kind of say like, hey, we realize that the checkout line is starting to back up, so we bring more cashiers and open up more lanes, so you can get more people through. And then as soon as you're done, once this workload is you know kind of done and over with, we close those machines back down. Those cashiers you know go back to stocking or whatever else they're doing in the meantime. So you know this is like the this is the um, you know, we we encourage people to set this number as high as you feel that you want to don't give users that experience. And uh, trust me when I say paying for a few, maybe even hundred or a thousand dollars of compute over a very short window of time above your steady state to remove hundreds of thousands of dollars of waiting and friction users is worth it every time. So, but yeah, it's automatically baked in. Um, You can control this and, you know, manually scale this with an API and you know all those things, but but we typically just say like, look, just set these scale points to what you're comfortable paying with and 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 dealing with, uh, and then and then align it to your workloads. Hey Kyle, then just just for uh, show show and tell, like you have one SQL warehouse right now, and it's using multi cluster load balancing behind the scenes, but you could have multiple SQL warehouses that are actually up and running at the same time too, correct? Oh yeah, of course, absolutely. So we can come up here and really easily just create you know my my test workspace and you know. Just choose something like this. You can set it to one to one. This is like typically, by the way, when we say like, you know, using like an um, uh, ETL based SQL compute or a standalone compute. So you'll notice that my other um, serverless example is a this is a uh, medium endpoint, um, but this one's just a large. Um, and so by having a larger T-shirt size, what that means is you do have more compute available even within the single cluster. So this would be a really great scenario for that really big data workload that needs to sit aside and not really interfere. Because again, you don't want to pay for this large concurrency for all these short, small queries you're seeing in BI. When you have that really large data set and you want to crunch through it, you need that extra vertical compute, like more nodes working on it and a bigger driver. You, know, you can spin this thing off on the side and you know operate against this. Uh, and again, then just stop it and throw it away when you're done with it. So you can do this also in a, in a job, for example, right? Spin up the right workload at the right time, use this and then uh, throw it away and only pay for the compute that you used. So, so I'll just shift from the, the technical side and move to the management side with budgeting. I'm assuming you guys are able to keep history and for the next year allow for your clients to maybe help them budget out their costs for this year over year? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So that, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I heard the question. I mean, and Leo can answer as well. We do this every day. That's our job as SAs um, and product specialists is we do have, obviously, we know how much you're being charged for our services. We capture it on the inside. Um, we want to connect that to the value that you're getting out of it and align on that. But yeah, absolutely. Um, all of this query history, even here at Databricks, is being um, recorded both for like, well, who's doing it? What's it being done on? How much is it costing us? Uh, and ultimately, we kind of use that for, for metrics uh, 
the same, we don't capture who's doing what at the customer side, but we do know that, you know, like you spun up this many warehouses, use them for this long of time. Obviously we charged you this much. Uh, how can we help you optimize those? That's a that's a huge part of uh, what Leo does at, at his customers. What I do as a product specialist is, is it being blunt, you know, we, we want you to find so much value in this. You use more because it's valuable, not because you're having to consume it and watch things spin, uh, you know, like over here on the, on the right-hand side, right? Like, you know, this, you know, these Synapse is getting paid the same amount, whether this thing spins or not. Um, we're getting paid the same amount, whether this thing spins or not. Uh, we want this thing not to spin, you know, that's, that's more the tactically Azure Databricks is a first party service. So everything's integrated with Azure cost management. So the cluster ID actually gets sent to the Azure cost management logs and you can literally analyze the individual cluster ID spend, you know, by day, by certain th like thresholds of time and kind of analyze that very granularly. Yeah, sorry, I, I meant, should have mentioned one more thing. You can tag them as well. So all this, you know, propagates back to Azure cost management. Um, so you're able to kind of see, you know, Quentin's the owner of this and, you know, he's not using this in the right way or some project code is running runaway queries. Um, we also have the ability, we even have some abilities in here to set things like um, query duration limits. Um, you can do, uh, we can actually, you know, again, from the individual queries, we know uh, not only who ran them, what warehouse they were run, but we do know, even know, like, for example, that this is coming from the ODBC driver. That's my script that's running in the back end. Uh, and if I go and run a Power BI query, it'll say Power BI as well. So we even know, you know, the sources of all this and you do as well as a customer. So you can make decisions based on that. Does Data Warehouse SQL requires Delta storage or it can work with regular Azure storage? Um, well, everything's using Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2, right? You're going to get the best performance within Databricks SQL using Delta Lake Storage format. But if you wanted to use Parquet or CSV files or JSON files, can you, can, you can still uh, execute those queries in Databricks SQL. Yeah, yeah. so everything gonna... that we're looking at today, I'm just showing right here, is, is an ADLS account that's in, in here. This is where the, the data is sitting that we're doing all the analysis on, um, you know, the daily trips, the raw yellow trips, and, and so on. Just all sitting out here in ADLS. So when we talk about that format really quick, just to kind of like really drive it home, it's a parquet file underneath with a delta log for transactions uh, and then a checkpointing thing for, you know, depending on where you're at in your commit cycle. Because I only wrote this one time, there's still a commit cycle. Every 10 commits, it'll sync this back into um, the parquet files and consolidate. But yeah, so yeah, this is the delta format, like in its raw form. So this will work also with regular files. That's correct. Is not that, that, that's correct. To be really, really clear and transparent on that, the performance really does depend on Delta. And it's not because of like the Photon engine can't work on that. It's that we can actually Photonize. So we see this thing down here called Photon. We talked about that engine earlier. Um, you know, when, when we have a query and it says the amount that was done in Photon, that does require, uh, some of it requires Delta, not all of it, but most of it. So you definitely will not get as good a performance if you're doing just Parquet as you will on Delta because of the photonizability and our ability to use those Delta snapshots to reduce at the end of the day, reduce the amount of data we wanted to do work on or optimize the, the work in some cases like uh, aggregates. Um, we can do those faster uh, on Delta tables. Um, Parquet is pretty fast. CSV and JSON, completely mixed bag. And yeah, any other questions? You have great questions. Yeah, one, one more question about the star schema. You were, you got a little bit in that when we were showing the demo fact tables and dimension tables. So yeah. for, so let's say the data is in Azure Data Lake, um, Delta, Delta Lake actually, uh, probably for best performance. So now they want to build like a star schema because that's what we typically do, right? So is your advice is to build that schema directly in uh, the Delta Lake? Or would it be your advice to go and actually spin ETL to load? Yeah, yeah, the... no, this is really good. Hey, Leo, can you share our screen really quick and, and bring the slides back up just to, to share the, the group? Um, because the short answer is like, obviously in addition to our, our Databricks SQL offering, we do have a full data engineering offering as well. Um, and, you know, so this isn't obviously Think about combining the design patterns. What we would say is, um, can you just go to the last slide, the, the the slide with the further reading stuff? You know, just kind of at the, uh, I think it's this one right here. So we have a bunch of links here. Um, I think this will kind of help you like address that. We do have like specifically how to load a data warehouse data model in real time, um, and you can do this in batch as well. There's data modeling best practices.
But we have this concept in compute of um, under our, sorry on our workflow side of Delta Live Tables. And really, what a Delta Live Table it is, it's entirely SQL. So, or you can use Python as well, but you can do everything in SQL script. And what it does is literally says start with those raw tables as they're landing from your. Again, we talked about the bronze, silver, gold. We can talk, you know, raw ODS dimension. Start with those raw tables and write SQL queries just like you would do today to do your ETL loads to move data from, you know, a three NF form, um, you know, master data form, and do those conjoint, you know, conform dimensions, and then build fact tables on top of them. Um, and we would recommend that you do that, right? You write those in SQL scripts. You configure that as a Delta Live table pipeline, and then as new data flows into your uh, from your source systems into your raw labor, you can have Delta Live tables work as a schedule trigger uh, or an event-based trigger. So as new data comes in, you can run it as soon as then. We're happy to do it um, as often or as little often as you want, uh, and then produce those dimensional models. So this is our um, what you call it, like our SSIS equivalent or Azure Data Factory um, equivalent, specifically for data warehousing. And then we have ability to orchestrate those with with our job. So take your pipeline, orchestrate it, and schedule it on a, on a regular basis, and produce that dimensional model. So this is what we would recommend. Again, this is still SQL. It still runs, but it just runs in a special compute, which is DLT pipelines, which is specifically designed around handling streaming uh, and non-traditional data sets like APIs uh, and and you know JSON files that come in and structured data, semi-structured data. Uh, and be able to convert those into dimensional models. And these links right here at the top have some really good best practices and uh, some notebooks you can follow to produce exactly that. So dimensional modeling inside data engineering side, uh, and then consume those in DB SQL, which we see more as like a read engine for for high read performance on top of those dimensional models. Is that is that helpful? It was. Thank you. Good. Uh, so I know we're at seven thirty. So uh, if any other yeah, questions or. We are we are about to wrap up. Maybe it's a good idea just to kind of recap because I don't know how about you guys, but you know, there's a lot of things that we learned today. So maybe I can finish with kind of recap and you guys let me know if I'm um, maybe kind of a little bit brainstorm and see if we're on the same. Yes. Can we get copies of the slides? Slides. Take like yeah, one. Yeah, one hundred percent. Absolutely. Of course. Yeah, go ahead. As a BI professionals, you know, it really depends on what kind of scenario you want to tackle. So let's say we are on um, maybe a small scale project. You know, let's say you talk to a customer, they have an ERP system on prem. They want to bring that data, they want to do like uh, analytics, and then you want to load that into a data model or data warehouse. Let's say we're talking about for them, big data is maybe a couple of million rows, right? So that's what. For most customers, that's what actually that's the, the world they live in. So now we are architects, we have to architect the solution, right? So uh, and I like your point. You were talking about, you know, you deal with large customers, Fortune 500 companies. But in this case, it's a mid-sized customer, you know, so we don't have that much data. So in this case, it sounds like what we know and what we're doing for a long time probably will work. So let's say if we decide to build that data mart on Azure. To be a cloud-based solution, it will spin ETL maybe with ADF. We'll bring that data over. We'll stage it in Azure SQL database. The advantage of that will be that we are use familiar tools because everybody knows relational databases. Uh, also, cost. You know, we haven't talked about how much a single cluster will cost in DataBricks, but if I do that, maybe with Azure SQL database. Their bill is going to be probably a few hundred dollars per per month because I can auto pause it, I can do uh, things with that. But the other scenario will be you have streaming data or you have you know data is coming from different directions, and this is where the things are getting interesting. So then there could be cases where it makes sense to stage that data as files into um, a uh, let's say Azure Data Lake. And then in this case, um, especially in the case where the data is changing, so you have uh, updates and inserts coming to you streaming or as files, this is where Delta Lake probably will be a better option. And if you go there, then obviously Databricks might bring you additional advantages because I can analyze that data, I can slice and crunch it um, very fast. So it looks like I don't have to load it into a relational database again, 
because I can do this analytics straight into Databricks. Does that make sense or yeah, it could is make that sense. a good summary? Uh, uh, in addition to that too, right? Like if you wanted to create a machine learning model on the data, then you okay. actually may want to do some stream scoring or even batch scoring on that data um, as well and actually have those machine learning results be displayed maybe okay. even in your star schema that lives inside of Delta Lake inside of Databricks SQL okay. and then service that to BI reports. I mean, that could be another use case as well. Sure. Um, or you, 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 things that need really high scalability. Yeah, um, and, would be and, a great fit. And, yeah, let me just let me just add one thing. I totally agree with everything Teo said. I think like again, we're an evolution of enterprise challenges that have existed for a long time, and we're we're there to mostly serve the large enterprise. Um, I think the biggest thing you can take away is like like Leo just said right there with machine learning streaming is like the world itself is is bringing a lot of interesting analytic challenges to bear. We've seen that with ChatGPT. We're seeing this with real time and the supply chain issues of the last few years. Like data itself is is not waiting for technology to catch up. Um, the problems that we have are only getting more complex, uh, and so we're we're trying to build the right solution to deal with those. Um, so there is a you know a level of sophistication that comes with the use cases for that that provide a little power, but you know not always the the right place to start, but a great place to evolve to. Excellent. And also, one thing that when they found is uh, like earlier I had to write a job function and events to generate those incremental changes. Now with auto loader. Like for a couple of years in government cloud, saying I'm government cloud with a few years behind the commercial cloud. So I could get it in a couple of lines of code. I don't have to do a your function. I don't have to create events, anything. I don't have to do any, any of those. And auto creates everything behind the scene. Really yeah, so. Autoloader like automatically and intelligently just determines and is able to see like, hey, this is a new file. This is a change file. Just absorbs it into the Delta Lake table and you don't have to like write any um, change or logic. It's like kind an of, event hook, basically. That's yeah, it, it, it effectively is smart enough yeah. and intelligent enough to know exactly like, what's right. new and what's changed. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's a well, notification well, service on top of it. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions, guys? Sorry for getting longer. I guess that's it. We're going to wrap up. Thank you, guys. I appreciate for yeah, no coming problem. and data. Thanks. Our next meeting will be April 3rd, so I'll see you here.